behalf of Pastor Steve and myself, we welcome you to our beautiful sanctuary here in beautiful Pine Creek Valley. As I walked in this morning, I couldn't help but marvel at the pretty sanctuary that we have. The pews, uh, our original pews going back to the 1860s. The chandelier is uh, also that old, and we have a picture of that in the early 1900s when it was coal oil lamps. But I also was struck by the fact that there's nobody here, just Kathy and myself. And then I thought, no, that's just not true. The Lord is here. We're in the presence of the Lord. And wherever you are today, when you hear this, you are in the presence of the Lord. He is by your side. So yes, maybe the church is empty of people, but it's not empty of the presence of God. God is wherever you are at, and that is what unites us as believers. The fact that we serve God who died for us and saves us. I want to shout out a special thanks again to Pastor Steve and Karen for all their efforts to make this happen, and for my wife who's also been involved. We thank you all for this. And I want to thank all of you who have sent in your gifts and offerings. Our website gives directions as to how to do that. So we thank you for those that have come in. We have some prayer requests today. We have some folks that have been impacted. Friends that come here to the church that have been impacted by the coronavirus. Parker Marshall Stoltz, who's lost a brother-in-law in Colorado to the virus. And I know some that have relatives who's, who are now going through the, the impact of the virus. Hoping they'll all be well. We also want to remember Karen and Justin and the Sider family. Uh, last weekend there was a fire at their cabin and there was extensive damage. So we pray that uh, they will be at peace about that whole process. And again, any other prayer requests that you have throughout the week, if you want to contact Pastor Steve or myself, we'd be glad, we'd be glad to include them. Let's bow our heads as we go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we are in your presence this morning, believing that you are a sovereign God in control of all things. We believe that you know about this virus and we believe that we should come to you for peace and the assurance that you are in control. We thank you for many answers to prayers over these last weeks, but we lift up to you this morning the folks that have been impacted, the folks that we know that have family and friends, but folks throughout the world that have been impacted by the virus. We pray for them and we pray that they will look to you for peace. And we pray at this time in history that many people will look to you for answers to all life's questions. We pray that many will come to know you as Lord and Savior. And we thank you for the reports that we've had from different organizations that we support that that has happened. We pray for Justin and Karen and the kids. We just ask that uh, you would guide them and direct them as they work through this process. We're so thankful that no one was hurt in the fire and the buildings can be fixed. Again, we pray your blessing now in this service. We ask that you would, that your name would be glorified today. The blessed name of Jesus. Amen. I'm glad we're back today. I want to tell you about God. God is Jesus, and Jesus is God. And Jesus came to earth to die for our sins, and he raised from the grave so that we can can be can have eternal life and live with him forever in heaven. It's a great thing to talk about because God is the one who will set you free from sin.
and sin is the bad stuff we do, and the bad stuff we think, and the bad stuff we say, and the bad stuff we do, and the bad stuff we say, like lying and not being truthful. Sin, sin is just on our heart, but God takes it and puts it on his own son while he's dying on the cross. He took our sin so that we can live with him for ever and that's amazing it's amazing that god takes our sin and gives it to and gives it to jesus and jesus dies on the cross and grays from the grave and he and we can have eternal life with him that's crazy but um, i just wanted to talk to you guys about that because i know i love jesus i just love you and i want to say goodbye goodbye everyone the little girl we just saw and listened to is five years old. Her name is Casey Llewellyn. As I watched this little girl of oh God, I was drawn to several scriptures. First from Psalm 8-2, from the lips of children and infants, you have ordained praises. Then from the Psalms again, Psalm 78 verses 5 and 6, he, meaning God, decreed statutes for Jacob and established the law in Israel, which he commanded our forefathers to teach their children so the next generation would know them, even the children yet to be born, and they in turn would tell their children. From Joel chapter 1, verse 3, kind of echoes those same sentiments. Tell your children. And Matthew's Gospel shares with us some more great truths concerning children. Matthew 18, 3. I tell you the truth, this is Jesus speaking, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Matthew nineteen fourteen confirms that idea and adds that the little children are precious, precious in his sight. And one more from Matthew 21, the temple has been cleansed, it's the Holy Week, and children are shouting in the temple area, Hosanna to the son of David. They were just a few days from the crucifixion. And the chief priests and scribes confront Jesus. They're, they're upset that the little children are singing this little praise. And they ask Jesus, angrily and indignantly do you hear what these children are saying and jesus replies yes have you never read from the lips of children and infants you have ordained praise the same quote from psalm 82 that we read a few minutes ago in the school business many teachers had a practice an exercise called show and tell a child would bring something to school and tell the class about it i actually was a benefactor of many of those show and tell experiences i uh, have in my pocket a couple of things that i received one is a little cross a family had gone to israel and the little boy brought in the, uh, some artifacts from Israel and this was a cross made out of olive wood and they wanted me to have that. I appreciate having that. This is actually a piece of the Berlin Wall. A little girl's father was serving in the army when the wall came down and she brought that pieces of wall to the school and used it for show and tell and I was able to get a piece. She gave me a piece. Now we've just come through the most precious and important time of the year for those of us that confess Christ as our Savior. The events that happened well over 2,000 years ago changed history, changed the way we even keep time. Before that event, it was BC and now it's 2020 AD. And this all relates to Jesus, to Jesus dying for us. But there came a time when Jesus ascended 
to his father. And Jesus' last instructions to us were very simple. He actually left behind our agenda. And it was a little different than the show and tell experience we may have had to endure in school. His instructions were not show and tell, but go and tell. Go and tell. Mark in his gospel uses the words, go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. Little five-year-old Casey in her short internet sharing, probably less than two minutes, does just what Jesus would want her to do. Just what Jesus would want us to do. Go and tell. And in her short talk, Casey perfectly captures the gospel message. Jesus is God. Jesus came to earth as a baby. Jesus was crucified. Jesus was buried. And Jesus rose. He rose from the dead. And she goes on to talk about sin and the reason why Jesus had to come. And it's oh so precious. As she says, what Jesus did, what Jesus did was this great thing. It sets you free from sin. And she says, sin is on our hearts. But God takes it when Jesus died on the cross. Jesus takes all the bad things and all the th bad things we do. And she says this with great joy in her heart and this wonderful expression in her voice. And she ends saying this, how amazing is that? I love Jesus. I love you. Now some observations I want to leave with you today. Some observations taken from Casey's little message. Number one, we are called to childlike faith. When we accept Christ, it is just that, an act of childlike faith. Jesus is saying, humble yourselves like a child and accept my gift and my sacrifice for you. Don't think that you can do it on your own. We tend to want to do that as adults, but it's childlike faith that saves us. I often think of this example with my family. When our boys were small, when they were toddlers, I would put them up on the kitchen counter and I would get them, they're just little guys, to jump off into my arms. And at first, they're reluctant. They don't want to do it. And then they make the leap and they know that dad's going to catch them then. And they want to go back and they want to do it again and again and again until I get tired of it. In childlike faith, we become Christians trusting God for all eternity, jumping into his arms, and we trust him for our very souls. Number two, obviously, someone shared with this little girl the tenets of the Christian faith. Proverbs 22, 6 reads, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not turn from it. Deuteronomy 11, 18 and 19 reads, Fix these words of mine in your hearts and minds. It goes on to say, Teach them to your children, talking about them when you sit at home, when you walk down the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. Write them on your door frames and on your gates. In other words, we are to immerse the children the very word of God. It's our job. And during this time of self-isolation, we can find ways to share the good news to our children, to our grandchildren, to our great-grandchildren. And even if they know Christ, 
Talk about other spiritual truths. This is a great opportunity to talk about why does God allow this? What's happening? Number three. Obviously, when you listen to little Casey, you can't help but be captivated by her, her joy and her enthusiasm. That word joy is a derivative, like joyful, joy, rejoice, and it's found from all through scripture. It's found all through scripture. We just studied Philippians and Paul in chapter one talks about his prayers being full of joy because he and the Philippian people were partnershiping and speaking and spreading the gospel. And in the third chapter of John's gospel, we find testimony from John the Baptist. And John the Baptist here uses the wedding ceremony as an analogy and the joy that comes when the bride hears the bridegroom's voice. And John wants everyone to know he is just a friend of the bridegroom. The bridegroom represents Jesus here. And John is happy to be there and he's full of joy. And if you read John 3.29, it goes like this. The bride belongs to the bridegroom, Jesus. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. And then these words from John the Baptist. That joy is mine and is now complete. He must become greater and I must become less. In other words, John found great joy in telling others that the Messiah was coming. John's job was to go and tell about this coming Jesus. Our little friend Casey found joy in telling us about the Messiah. And we, you and I, should find joy in telling others about our Jesus and what he's done for us. Go and tell with joy. Number four, Casey had no fear. She had no fear in sharing the gospel. And neither should we. Listen to these words, Jesus' words from the 12th chapter of Luke, verse 4. I tell you, friends, do not be afraid of those who kill up the body. And after that, they can't do no more. Let me read that again. I tell you, friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body. And after that, can do no more. We should proclaim the gospel with boldness. I think we can all remember the images from February the 15th, 2015. ISIS was parading 21 Christians along the Libyan coast. All 21 were dressed in these orange jumpsuits, all prepared to go to the deaths. They were not going to deny Christ on that day. And they didn't. But part of the story you may not have heard is this. One man out of the 21 was not part of their original group. He was not from their country. He was from a different country. And he was not a Christian before he met those other 20. And before his execution, he was asked if he would renounce this God. And this is, this is what he said. Their God is my God. These folks had obviously shared the faith with this man. They obviously told him about Jesus. And now he's willing to die for his Savior. Their God is my God. And finally, during this time when 
when we are self-isolating, perhaps this would be a good time to reflect, to reflect on what's most important in our lives. Is God number one? Is this simple gospel message so eloquently expressed by Casey in his simple terms? Is that what we're about? Are we sharing the gospel story? Or are other things more important to us? If we're not sharing this gospel message, we're not following Christ's instructions to go and tell. And I don't know why. Are we afraid? Are we too busy? Are we not serious about eternity? You know, Scripture is very clear in stating that when death comes, when death comes, there are only two possible destinations for our soul. Heaven and an eternity with God, or hell, and an eternity without God, separated from Him. Can you? Would you? Would you commit today, right now, to go and tell, to share the gospel message with someone this week? And do it with a boldness and the joy of a little five-year-old named Casey. It's our calling. God bless. journey from